like me, right? So just know that even in your broken state, or if you're rich, or if you're okay, God loves you in whatever state you are. And so I just want to take this time to tell you how happy I am to have you on sharing in another wonderful session of Women of Power Improving Nicely. And as I always say, the moment you clicked on that link, the moment that you decided to stop by here this Thursday night, it puts you right in the category of a woman of power. And I know that by God's grace and with God's help, that you will continue to improve nicely. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to ask you, um, Sister Elena, if you could just pray. You came on very early. And so I'm just going to ask you if you could pray, present this evening session before God as we take, um, before we go any further. Good night, everyone. Hi. I don't know if you can hear me because I don't even, I don't have any internet. I'm on my data now, but it's not very it's spotty. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing so you. So I, I, okay. Father, we thank you. We adore you. We honor you tonight. Mighty God, you have brought us thus far and we glorify your name. Thank you, Jesus. Mighty God, you have us, God, this time in this season. And because, Thank mighty you, God, you still remember us, we are here in this session to exalt Thank your you, muchness, to let you know how much we are grateful, mighty God, that you have given Thank us the breath of life. Mighty God of Daniel, it's no good that we have done, but because God, your Thank you, Jesus. Renewed to have place in order to be fulfilled. So you give us this opportunity one more time to come before your throne of mercy to worship you. Thank you, you Jesus. Mighty Hallelujah. God of and in this manner, it is a worship session, mighty God, for Thank women of you, power. Jesus. Oh, God, to improve in your statue, to improve God Almighty in what you want us to do. Because God Almighty, you know of a certainty, God, that we would be here tonight, mighty God. So we ask of you, mighty God, and now to edify your people, Lord God Almighty. In the name of God Jesus. Almighty, mighty God, so that we can put, oh God, one foot the before the other and make decisive decisions according to your kingdom, mighty God, to allow us to make good decisions, good financial Jesus, decisions. Jesus, yes, Lord. You have blessed us with God Almighty. Allow Thank us, Jesus. God Almighty, to be good stewards. Oh God, of what you have blessed us yes, with, Spirit Lord, of hallelujah. the living God. Yes, it's Jesus. About the mighty God. God. It's not all about the physical. It's also about the gifts, mighty God. Mighty the blessings Jesus. Have been upon us, mighty God, so that we can use them in effective ways, mighty God, so that we can build your kingdom. We can use them in effective way, God Almighty, to pass the blessing along. Mighty God is not only about God Almighty, the, the, the physical, but it's all about the blessing Jesus, of knowing. Jesus. Mighty God, the blessing of understanding. Standing. And tonight, God Almighty, I place each and every one of us, God, that will be in this in program. In the name of Jesus. Your fear. Lead us, mighty God. Yes, you, Jesus. Jesus our Father. Lead us, mighty God. As mighty you, Redeemer. The glory, God Almighty, to come out of this mighty God, to give Jesus. you glory, honor, and place. I put the speaker before you tonight, God. Cover her from the crown of her head to the very sole of her feet. Yes, Mighty Lord. God, God, heighten our knowledge as 
pay capacity right now, mighty God. Allow her to Thank be you, liable Jesus. in your hands tonight, God. At whatever avenues, God, you see fit for her to tread. Mighty God, allow her to be pliable, movable, God, flexible, under your will tonight, God Almighty, so that your people, Abba Father, can absorb whatever you have put into her to give unto us tonight. Mighty God, mighty Jesus. God, do us with this session and let your will be done in us and through Hallelujah. Us. Jesus' name. Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you so much, Sister Elena, for praying. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you continually. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So I just want to continue to say welcome to everyone um, to another session of Women of Power. Improving nicely, we say win for short. So women of power, improving nicely. And here on win, our motto is embracing who we are while morphing into our better selves. So we love who we are. We appreciate who we are. We are thankful. We are grateful for who we are and where we are in our journey in life. But like the butterfly, we are conscious that, you know, there is, well, the caterpillar, the process of the caterpillar um, going through the metamorphosis process to becoming a butterfly. We want to be that beautiful butterfly, that beautiful person that God intended us to be. And so we are embracing who we are. We are being kind to ourselves. We are loving ourselves and we are being true to ourselves, but we are also intentional about our growth. So really in a nutshell, that is what we are about. And I am your host. I am Pastor Nicola Maxwell Johnson. And it again is my pleasure. There are so many things you could have been doing tonight, but I thank you that you are here. There are about 20 through 21 or so of you on. And so I want to encourage you to invite somebody because tonight is gonna be an, another interesting night here on WIN, we are going to be talking about money, financial freedom, and who doesn't want financial freedom? I'm sure if you were to check um, the richest people in Jamaica, the richest people in the world, as a matter of fact, you know, they want more, right? And it is not necessarily about riches per se, but it's about that freedom, right? So tonight we have a lovely speaker, a money coach. She is good at this, right? And she is going to take us on a journey of how we can use scriptural um, references, um, biblical references to achieve a financial freedom. And as women of power, as God's daughters, as his children, who doesn't want to hear about that? So invite somebody to come on over tonight. So again, our topic tonight is applying faith principles to your pursuit of financial freedom. Because if we are all to be truthful, we are, thank you, Tashana, we, we are all, um, you know, pursuing financial freedom. But what principles are we applying? Are we applying the principles of the world or are we going to, as children of God, as daughters of God and sons, if there are any sons on here, are we going to apply faith principles, biblical, scriptural principles to, um, to achieve this financial freedom? Interestingly, I was, while I was preparing earlier, I was looking to see if I could find, you know, any little like TikTok video or something like that about financial freedom. And I found a whole lot with all sorts of different, um, what you call it, different information of, of different instructions and different recommendations. I came across all different sorts of instructions and all of those things, right? And I stopped and I said, hmm, if I were to, you know, just go out in, on a limb, to say I want to um, get some information, get some advice about how I can be financially free. And I came across all of these. I'd be confused. I wouldn't know what to do. Some of them, if you ask me, were kind of impractical. 
right? But I am sure that tonight, get your papers and your pens and your little books because I thought about it too. We can come here tonight and we can hear some lovely things, but unless we put them into practice, unless we receive them, unless we accept them, and unless we put them into practice, it is not going to serve us any good, right? So again, I want to welcome you all and share the link with somebody. You know, sometimes we take a little while to come on, but we are moving on just the same. So as usual, I have my little quotes, right? Because I think that I, I, I always like to find quotes that are um, relevant to the topics because they give us something to think about, right? They, they, they are thought provoking, actually, literally thought provoking. So this one says, financial freedom is available to those who learn about it and work for it. So financial freedom, unless we learn about it and we are here tonight, be like you're in a class and be absolutely um, appreciative of the fact that you're here tonight because trust me, these things we have to pay some big money to go to some seminar for some people to tell us some little things and then we have to come back again and pay again and come back again. But we are so grateful tonight that we have a daughter of the king who is here willing to share what she knows with us. And of course you can follow up with her and she will tell you all about that afterwards. So um, I'm gonna stop right here because you know, I will talk and talk and talk, but I want to get you engaged. Now, on a scale of one to 10, one being definitely not financially free and 10 being totally financially free, how would you rate your financial freedom on a scale of one to 10? You can put it in the chat, open your mic. On a scale of one to 10, how financially free would you say that you are? I think I'd say I'm about a seven. So I hope y'all are hearing me and understand. All right, somebody say a five, okay. I think I'm maybe about a seven. Maybe my number may go up or down after Madame is finished <laughs> with us tonight. Somebody say a three, that's okay, right? On a scale of one to 10, I am broke. <laughs> All right, Carrie, and I see you, my friend. Our sister Judith says a four. How financially free are you? Yannick says a five. All right, right in the middle ground there. Michelle says one. All right. Okay, Michelle, I know you will climb. You can only, Tasha and I say broke. That's not even on the scale. All right. Y'all at the right place. We are all at the right place. So on a scale of one to 10, so I got a few responses. Don't be shy. Don't be, you know, intimidated. Some people have one. Some people put zero, you know, so don't feel intimidated Um, if you are at a two or a three. It is what it is. Life goes on, you know. But the important thing is that you're here tonight. And I'm sure that next time we come back around and we ask this question, you're at a 10 or a 12 or a 15. Yes? All right, so on a scale of one to 10, how financially free are you, right? And finances, listen, we can sit here all night and talk. It's one of those things that keep people up. It's one of those things that give people body come down and heartache and pain and stress, right? And send up people blood pressure and all of those things. But we want to put a dent into that and to change that tonight by learning because knowledge is power. And the word of God says, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. This one says, money is a terrible master, but an excellent servant, right? A terrible master. And the word of God says that we ought not to be lovers of money. But the word of God also says, and I'm always quick to point out this to people, that uh, money answer it all things, right? So we need money, but we're not going to love it. We're not going to let it be the master of us, but we shall let it serve us. And we want to learn some more about that tonight. And the next one, I think I have one more after this. 
It's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep, how hard it works for you and how many generations you keep it for. So I'm gonna stop right here and ask somebody, what are your thoughts on this um, quote right here? Um, that it's not how much money you make. We have always heard this. It's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep, how hard it works for you and how many generations you keep it for. Can somebody just share with us what you think? Don't leave me here alone. Somebody, all right, let the teacher in me now start to call a name. Na, 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 na. All right, somebody put something in the chat. Well, the question is, what are your thoughts um, on the quote? I don't know if you're seeing the quote that is on the screen that says, um, it's not how much money you make. And we have always heard this, and it goes a little further to say, it's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep. So it seems like it's not the making is the problem, it's the keeping is the problem, and how hard it works for you, and how many generations you keep it for, right? I, I think about it, and I have nothing to inherit from my mother, I have nothing to inherit from my father and my children. I want to be able to leave something for them. Not necessarily just money, but you know, have something for them. Danasha says, it is true. However, it is difficult to save when you have bills competing for every dollar you work. Thank you for sharing that, Danasha. Anybody else want to um, make your two cents? Um, heard. What do you think about this that says it's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep? Come on, I feel so very lonely here tonight. Yes, that's true. All right. Not how many you made is how many you say, but guess what? We, we all want something for our kids. As you said, our parents didn't leave us nothing, but we want to change that by leaving something for our kids. Even if it's not money, but something I value. All right, thank you for that, Janice. And I see Kid Donna uh, put in the chat that says, if you can't save small, you can't save big. I like this. If you can't say, right, and our Madam Coach is agreeing. If you can't save small, I've never thought about this. If you can't save small, you can't save big. Right. And what are our saving practices? You know, what what um so a lot of times we've heard this that it's not how much money you make, but I always think and say, but then if me now make enough, I can't keep enough. And I'm sure many persons are right there with me. Go ahead, Hillary. <laughs> that is that is so true because are you hearing me? Yes, I am. Yes. One of the issues that we have, you know, people of color is that we don't think generational. Yes. We tend to just think for now. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at us, sometimes many of us, when, when we die, unfortunately, we have to have a collection to bury mm -hmm. us because not even, we don't have life insurance. We don't think far ahead, outside of maybe college that's the that's sometimes i think that's the, the maximum we go mm -hmm. but we have to change that mentality and be like the italians and the other races that when they when when their parents are dying or when their parents die they when and their kids get married they can give their kids money to start their life mm -hmm. we, in our culture we 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 struggle with that as you said recently i thought about it i mean i said my god we know my family have money. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be it's that like one. Nobody, it's like nobody is like wealthy. Nobody is wealthy yet. Yeah, exactly. Because I am wealthy. I keep telling myself that. But this, I'm looking forward to, to what she has to say tonight. But we have to change that mindset. And, and as you say, we have to start with a little. Sometimes we feel that so we have to have this whole heap of money. For yeah. me personally, I, I I say my money come out 
it comes out before it comes into my hand. That's how I save. Because if it's for me to take it and put it in the bank or put it away, it's not going to happen. So it comes out before it comes to me. So that's how that's one way how I save. So I'm I'm, I'm really interested to see what she has to present to us tonight. Thank you, thank you, Lady Hillary. And another thing that just um I'm just reminded that, and I always say this, especially you say people of color as black people. I, I can only talk about black people because I am black, right? As black people, I think that the first thing we do when we get, and especially Jamaicans, want money. The first thing we do when we get our money is we decide how to do away with that money as fast as possible, right? So we're in a partner and we're going to get a partner draw and we, we, we are we, we getting last draw and there are like 10 draws. And from we, the partner start, we de designate already. Not that it's a bad thing, but we designate already how we're going to spend that money, how we're going to get rid of that money, right? We're getting a nice little retro from the government teachers. Yes, we're getting a nice little retro and we decide already how we're just going to do it with that money. We're just going to dissolve it. We're just going, you know, spend it, right? Um, I remember years ago when this was a big thing in Jamaica, uh, Matt D's auto. And I remember watching the owner at the time on profile. And he said, he said at that time, and I remember I was very young and I'm like, mm -mm, no, sir, you wrong that there's only one use of money and it's to spend it. Me, I said, no, man, you can't save it too. You can't invest it. You can't put down something rainy deal, right? But some people are of that mentality that there's only one thing to do with money, but to spend it. Anyway, I am not the presenter because Lord knows, as I said, I have my book on my pen that I want to take down some notes and add to what I already know because knowledge can never be too much. And so we are running along. Anybody else has anything they want to add before I move on? What a more than slower. Mm -hmm, you know them way there. But tonight we're going to learn how to stop a gap and fix some of those bleeding problems. All right. So it says here, financial planning and discipline is key to one's financial freedom. And I heard Lady Hillary a while ago alluded to the fact that, you know, she has to make the money come out before she gets it. So it goes down to discipline. How disciplined are we? How disciplined are we? Because I think that things like discipline um, is some of the problems that we have, or indiscipline rather, right? So tonight we are going to learn how we can apply faith principles in our pursuit of financial freedom. We all want to live a stress-free life when it comes to money. Listen, um, you have, Joy Bass said, I had not had any inheritance left by my parents. You can't spend everything, right? Um, and sometimes, so you know, the inheritance, so it's a touchy thing, you know, like really, really hard for you working a coal and son and then left the inheritance to some pity just go waste and blow and spin out in it. It's a tough one, that. But anyway, it does not go down that road. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're moving along because we want our presenter to have as much time as possible this evening to take us on this journey and to share her knowledge and her expertise on how we can um, apply faith principles in our pursuit of financial freedom. And as always, on Win is like when we on we specialize in having beautiful presenters, right? We specialize in having beautiful presenters. So here this evening, our beautiful presenter, and I hope I'm not butchering your last name, ma'am, is Charlene Tilbany. I hope I got it right. You correct me when you come on. She's a chartered accountant by profession with over 20 years experience and currently works in the financial services sector. So the lady know what you're talking about. Listen, all right. She has been consumer debt free, hey, for over 10 years. Listen, I want to live with you. You have any space in the house? I want to come move in with you in the class. <laughs> consumer debt free for over 10 years and strongly believes 
that everyone should be financially literate. She also believes that everyone has the ability, listen, to experience some measure of financial freedom. Okay. Her passion for personal finance was birthed out of her own debt-free journey. Her personal experience, coupled with her professional background as a chartered accountant, led her to personal financial and money coaching, where she helps Christian women mm -hmm, work of the Lord, experience the joy and confidence that comes from being in control of their own money. Hallelujah. She believes it is possible to break free from financial stress and build wealth for generational and kingdom impact. I love it. She can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under the name Charlene Money Coach. And right here tonight on a win, we have the lady herself, Miss Charlene Money Coach. And we just welcome you. We thank you for being here. Share the link, people. Tell the people them to come. Your cousin will always a ball to them and the money. Your auntie will always a come borrow. Tell them to come, come learn tonight. Amen. Over to you, Madam Charlene. Thank you so much, Pastor Nicola. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hope you all are doing well and excited to talk about church and money. It's one of yes. my favorite topics to talk about. So if I get extremely passionate, <laughs> that is why. Um, can I get? Okay, you're gonna share. To share my screen. Yeah. Oh. All right, let me stop. Try now. Should All be, right. So. Let me try here. So who here is excited to learn me. about our topic today? Me. Let me see me, me, some reaction in the, <laughs> in the comment, in the chat section. Me, teacher. Me. <laughs> I am excited too. It's, as I said, it is one of my favorite topics to talk about because I believe that, and we'll get to it in my presentation, I believe that our church is, have done us a disservice as it relates uh -huh. to money. But we're going to change that tonight. And I hope that at the end of tonight's session, you will have a better understanding of exactly what God has for you as it relates to your money. We might be unearthing a lot of things that you grew, grew up in the church hearing. We might be discovering a lot of false beliefs or misconceptions that you have, but I am 100% certain that tonight you will learn at least one thing as it relates to how to apply faith your faith principles, the Bible, that's what we're talking about. We're all Christians here to your pursuit of financial freedom. And yes, it, it is possible to merge the two. They don't have to be separate. So wow. let me see in the chat if you're ready for me to go. We're ready, ready, hope, ready. Hope you have your notebooks, your pen, mm -hmm. whatever note-taking device you have. We're going to get started. And if you see me looking to one side, I have the chat going on on another device because I can't see it on my laptop. I'll help you. <laughs> All right. So to start off, let me know in the chat, how do you feel about wanting to do better with money? You know that you're not doing such a great job with money, but you don't know where to start. How many persons can relate to this? Let me see it in the chat. How many of you set the same financial goals year after year after year? And at the end of the year, you're pretty much at the same place that you started the year or probably even worse off. All right. I see some persons reacting in the comments and saying, yep, they can. Me, hands up. You can relate to this. How do you feel about setting the same goals year after year after year? The same goals you set in 2010, you're still setting them in 2020. 2021, 22, 23, how do you feel about that? Not making,
All right, I'm not sure what happened. Her widely, day. and Michelle says she feels frustrated. Mm -hmm. I can relate. How do you feel about our churches always talking about sowing a seed, paying <laughs> your tithes, and giving an offering, and contributing to the church building fund, and the fish fry, and the barbecue, and yet you are there wondering, when are you going to receive your financial breakthrough? Yes. Let me, how do you feel about this? Honestly, this is one of the things that annoys me in churches. I remember they used to have some of us go up every Sunday and boost the offering. And I did it twice and I told them never call me to do that again. Because I believe that we need to get certain principles in place first before we are hyper-focusing on giving and sowing a seed and all of that. And I believe by just focusing on one side, we are building resentment in our people, but we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. How do you feel about seeing needs in your community? Wanting to give, wanting to help people, but you can't find the money to do so freely. And how do you feel about wanting more out of life? You see everybody prospering mm -hmm. and you are there in your corner, in your zone, feeling trapped because you just cannot get ahead. You just cannot break through financially and you just feel as if you're missing out. Let me know how you feel. Tasha answers she feels really sad. And then Asha says, it's demotivating. 13 years ago, I asked all of these questions and then some. And when I answered the questions, I felt that church failed me, society failed me, and school failed me. And you may be wondering, hmm, church, society, and school, yes. That is exactly how I felt. Now, as you heard in the intro, I have been a chartered accountant. I grew up in Jamaica. I did the ACCA exam, and that is a designation that I got when I finished my exams, chartered accountant. If you're in the US or in Canada, they call it CA or CPA, same thing, just different jurisdictions. And I have been one for over 20 years. And having that professional qualification, I had a good job, always had a good job. There was a point when I was just out of college, just finished my qualifications, I was getting promotions upon promotions. Like there was a point where every six months I would be getting promoted. Now, you know what comes with promotion, right? Yes. Salary increase. All right. Yes, the work pressure and the stress increases, but it comes with salary increase. But in spite of that, what was happening to me? Living paycheck to paycheck. And this continued for years. Just know I was not rich. <laughs> I was living paycheck to paycheck. On the outside, mind you, I looked like I had it all together. I had the car and I had the nice suit, you know, in Jamaica, how we can dress to impress. Yes. The and the shoes and the handbag. And yeah, mm -hmm. I had it all together. The reality was I was as broke as a church mouse. I only had it going on on the outside. Reality was paycheck to paycheck. So I thought, you know what? I need more money because clearly I'm not being paid well enough. So I need more money in order to get out of this cycle. So as with all of us as Jamaicans, we tend to look to greener pastures. So I migrated. I didn't move very far. I moved to the Cayman Islands. And yes, the pasture was greener. The money was stronger. But guess what happened? One day in 2010, about a year and a half after moving here, just got paid. Some money should be in my bank account, right? Just got paid. Went to the ATM to draw my salary as per usual. When I went to draw my salary, 
insufficient funds. What? Like, what is going on here? How can I have insufficient funds and I just got paid? After going inside the bank and asking for a printout of my account, I realized that I had less than $100 in my bank account. Marcy. Before you know, move from Jamaica, supposedly doing well, parents think I'm doing well, sister think I'm doing well, one, not even $100. It was less than $100 in my bank account on payday. Have rent to pay, bills to pay, ties to pay, all the things to pay, plus my debt, no money. What had happened was one of the banks who I owed money to, because I left loans in Jamaica, moved and accumulated even more loans. One of the banks here thought that I was going to forfeit or run away and not honor my obligations. So they seized my salary. They pretty much garnished my wages. And it turns out that what I owe there was pretty much equivalent to my salary. So they just took it. Wow. They just took it, right? And that was my wake up, come to Jesus, something needs to change moment. <laughs> I call it my rock bottom moment. And when I faced my numbers, I realized that I owed at the time over 22,000 US dollars in debt. Remember, this was 13 years ago. Even now, that is a lot of money to owe people, but it was even more money. Back. Yes. And you might be wondering, how was that possible? And you're in a good job. What happened? Like what led to this circumstance where you- Did you have five children? Because I tend to think that if you don't I, have any children- <laughs> No children at the time, not even married. It was just me and Jesus alone, Hi. right? And that was my situation. And that is why I said, school failed me. Society, like I felt like everybody failed me. Like, I'm like, how could this happen? A girl who is educated, who is an accountant by profession, don't leave out that part. So mm -hmm. I'm managing people's money day in and day out. And my personal finances were a hot mess. Now, here is why I especially felt that the church failed me. You see, I grew up in church. If I didn't know better, I would think I was conceived in church because I was always at church. My parents were ministers. And back then, things have changed now. But back then, once the church doors were open, my sister and I would be at church, right? No matter what. If we had homework to do, we would sit at the back and do our homework, fall asleep on a tough bench. But yeah, we're always in church. So for my entire life, I've been in church, Bible study, Sunday school, Sunday service, Sunday night, everything, prayer and fasting. And not once did anybody tell me that the answers to my money issues were in the Bible. They were right in front of me all along. And it was not until I started studying the Bible for myself that I realized that there are over 2,300 verses in the Bible that only talk about money. Wow. Think about that for a second. Wow. We're not talking about prayer. We're not talking about fasting. We're not talking about faith. We're not talking about healing. In fact, it is said that the Bible talks about money more than it talks about any other topic. What? The Bible talks about money more than it talks about any other topic. Did anyone know that? No. <laughs> How many of you, let me know in the chat, knew not that me. There were so many verses in the Bible that talked about this issue that affects so many of us. I certainly didn't know. And that's why I felt that the church failed me. Because the only verses I grew up in church hearing were about tithing and sowing a seed. Even and it shall be given money. back to you. Good measure there is pressed you go. down. And we're going to go through the other ones, like the love of money. <laughs> yes. Those are the scriptures I grew up hearing about money in church not about what we're going to talk about tonight 
And when I discovered that, everything, when I said everything, everything totally transformed in my life because I realized that, hey, I didn't need to struggle. So I started studying personal financial literacy, so the practical side of things, plus I started studying what the Bible had to say about financial literacy. And that debt that I had, that $22,000 worth of debt, I paid it off in 15 months. Did you change your job, get more money? I did not change my job. I did not have a second income. It was a one. You never have seven streams of income. You never have no seven streams. It was later that I discovered all of that, right? That you didn't sow a seed. What's that? <laughs> you didn't you sow a seed. <laughs> but listen, we're going to get to that at the very end. I do not want to discount the power of tithing and, and sowing seeds and, and helping, right? I don't want to discount that. I just think that there is so much more to money than just that, right? But yes, I believe that tithing had a big part to play in the favor that I have gotten then and I'm still reaping now, right? But I wanted to realize that money in the Bible is way more than that. And the same principles that I used to pay off that debt how many years ago has allowed me and circumstances have changed since then because I'm now married has allowed me and my husband to remain consumer debt free for all that time. That's over 10 years. Yeah, 10, 11 years and counting. We've been able to stay consumer debt free. If we can't find the money to do what we want to do, we ain't buying it. Of course, that excludes your mortgage, right? Mortgage is a different type of debt, but we're talking about credit cards and car loans and higher purchase and unsecured loan and payday loans. All of those, it is possible for you as a child of God to live without any of those because they come with a lot of stress. So leading to that, I have been able to help Christian women because I developed this passion to help not just women, but Christian women especially because I believe we have not been taught these things that I have learned uh, help Christian women to experience the joy and the confidence because there is this deep-seated joy that comes from being able to manage your own money so, and to be able to be in a place where you're not stressed out and confused and overwhelmed about money but you have financial peace and financial peace is gonna be different for everybody but I help my clients to define whatever financial peace is for them and I help them to get it. And my clients have been able to make money because there ain't nothing wrong with making money as a child of God. I help them to spend their money wisely, pay off debt, build generational wealth for their children. We talked about that in the introduction to give more money, right? And overall to glorify God through good financial stewardship because many of us don't realize that the blessings that we have been given we are accountable to God to how as to how we manage it and if oh. we mismanage it then we are not being good financial stewards oh. so who is ready to hear about how they can do the same and more let me know I you. am talk to me then cause <laughs> So we're going to talk about church and money, some misconceptions in our churches about money. And then we're going to get to the meat of the matter, which is how you can essentially get to financial freedom, whatever financial freedom looks like for you. I'm going to outline seven steps to get in there. Hillary, consumer debt is any debt that you borrow money to buy things that do not increase in value. So think about oh. things like a credit card. Many times we use our credit cards to shop or to pay bills, and none of those things actually increase in value. Another thing would be higher purchase, right? When we go and we take out things at the furniture store, none of those things that we buy 
are increasing in value. They are going down in value. The only thing that goes up in value is a piece of land or a house, right? So consumer debt is simply put anything outside of mortgage, mortgage debt. Including yes, a car too. Including a car. The very minute, even if you buy a brand new, never driven 2023 car, the minute you drive it off the car lot, it loses 10% of its value. If you buy it for $2 million and you drive it off the car lot, you cannot get $2 million for it because it immediately loses value. So wow. yes, a car is also <laughs> part of consumer debt because it's not you buying an asset that goes up in value. All right. So I want you to take 30 seconds and I want you to imagine yourself as a woman of God. And if there are any men here, fine. Picture yourself thriving in life, not just surviving, not just existing, not just Ooh. living paycheck to paycheck, but actually happy, peaceful, thriving, spending money on the things you value, the things you enjoy, having fun, while at the same time honoring God, walking in abundance, and building wealth. Mm. And he might be saying, how is all of that even possible? It is. And I'm going to show you how you can do it. And I hope that you're ready to take notes tonight. You see, the problem that I have found is that our church, our churches, they have not taught us the truth, the whole truth about money. And this is not to blame the churches because people can't teach what they don't know. Mm. Right. And if you don't know it, then you can't preach it from the pulpit or you can't teach it in Sunday school or Bible study. Right. But the reality is there's a lot of truth that's sitting unlocked in scripture that we have not been taught. And the second thing I have realized is the world is prospering while using biblical principles to make money, to grow money, to invest money to pass on money to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren while we in the church, we remain stuck and we ignore the principles. Anybody can relate? That's true. That says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? And the sad reality, and it's what I have seen physically, is that the world is using stuff that we should be doing, stuff that my, my. is in the Bible, you know, and they're doing it and they're making money. They're investing it and they're leaving it for their children and for the next generation and five generations to come. And we still having to keep fish fry and barbecue <laughs> and go. And tile drive. Right? When we should not have to do that. We should not have to do that. Now, let me know if any of these sound familiar to you growing up in church. And I know in the Jamaican culture, we have heard this. Mm -hmm. Money is the root of all evil. How many of you have heard that? Me. Rich people you cannot won't. go to heaven. You cannot serve God and money. This is true, you know. That's what the Bible says. But many times it's taken out of context to keep people down and to keep people from feeling as if they should not desire wealth. And some of us hold the view of the last one. God will supply my daily needs. Therefore, I don't need to worry about money because God will always come through and God will provide. And by saying that, we are essentially excluding ourselves from the responsibility of managing what God has put in our hands to manage, right? How many of you have heard any of these? Just says the truth is some church bank accounts are fat, but they hold it back and still stress the congregants. There is some truth to that, right? Well, let's flip it tonight, right? Let's flip it so that our bank accounts can be fat too, so that we can help those in our communities that have need, that we see day to day, the neighbor and a little child who is going to school hungry and the person who needs help with their medical bills. 
Those are things that we can use our wealth to do, and it's all a part of glorifying God. Now, as I said before, the solution to this problem is right in front of us. It's, 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 it's the physical Bible or the digital Bible that we have on our phones and our tablets. It's right there in the word of God, because the reality is the Bible is the perfect manual for managing our money. Every single thing that I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to show you one, at least one scripture to back it up. But trust me, as I said before, there are 2,300 verses in all. So there could we could sit here all night and we don't exhaust all of them because the Bible does have the roadmap and the perfect way for us to manage our money. So tonight we're going to talk about seven steps. Seven steps. So financial freedom, whatever financial freedom looks like for you. For some, it is just being able to pay their bills on time. For some, it is being able to get out of debt. For somebody else, it might be able to retire early and do what they want with their time. Whatever financial freedom looks like for you, all of this that we're going to talk about is a way to get there, right? And number one, set realistic goals. We need to have goals and plans for our money because if we don't have any goals, we will not make any progress. If you don't have a plan for your money, it's going to disappear. If you just get paid and you decide that you're just going to pay the bills and whatever happen, happens, then you're going to be in the same rut year after year after year, decade anyway, after, Mark, decade after decade, right? Because you don't have any plan. Scripture, Proverbs 21, verse 5. Good planning and hard work, what does it do? It it's leads prosperity. to prosperity. And this is what the wealthy do. They sit and they make plans for their money. We, a lot of us, we just spend and we say, you know what, whatever happens, happens. And there is more money than money anyway. And I can't get ahead. And that is just how it will be. No, you have to make a plan. If one way isn't working, what's your plan B or plan C or plan D? But you cannot just be operating day in, day out without a plan. Proverbs 21 verse 5, Jazz. Now, some of us think we make goals, you know, and our goals are like, oh, I want to save more money this year. Or I want to spend less money. Or I want to do better with money. And when persons come to me with these goals, I'm like, okay, what does save more money mean? You, you mean you want to save $1 more, $10 more, $1,000? You need to have some measure or some way that you can measure exactly how or when you have accomplished this goal. So you need to set specific goals that are realistic. So for example, I want to save $50,000 this year. Is that something that you can measure? Talk to me in the chat. Yes, yes, or, definitely, definitely. Or I want to pay off my credit card debt in full. Is that something that you can measure your progress to see how close or how far you are from that target? Or I want to create a budget every single month for the year. And you have stick 12 to it. months in a year, you know that you're going to create a budget every single month, right? Those are specific and realistic goals that you can actually measure. And when I say realistic, if you know that you're earning $20,000 a month, for argument's sake, right? There is no way you can say I want to save $50,000 for the month, right? That is you setting yourself up for failure. So you have to look at your situation, your circumstances, and make a goal that you can realistically achieve based on your situation. The second thing, and I should have really put this one first, but I put it as number two. Adjust your mindset. Now, your mindset, how you think, how you feel about money, it's the attitude that you have about finances. And what happens is, 
It affects how you make financial decisions every single day. And unfortunately, many of us as black women and as Christian women, we struggle with a negative and a scarcity mindset. We think that things will never work out. We think that things are stacked against us, that people are against us and we will never get ahead. We think that we are bad with money because we grew up poor, we'll never get ahead. It's hard to make money and that you know what, money is bad, so I'm gonna reject it. Can anyone here relate to any of that? That's true. I certainly struggled with a negative mindset when I just started. And it was one book, The Power of Positive Thinking. It's written by a man called Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote that book, and it's based on biblical principles. It was Can you repeat it, please? The Power of Positive Thinking. That book started the transformation in my mind about life in general. And it helped with money too. Because as I said, how you think about money affects how you spend money. It affects whether or not you go after that bigger job or that promotion, or you try to get a side hustle. All of that affects exactly how you manage money. Now look at a woman with a positive mindset. She will say, yeah, I might be struggling right now, but I can learn. I can learn how to manage money. And the woman with a positive mindset will recognize that money isn't evil, but it is the love of money that is evil. And the woman with a positive mindset can also recognize that money is a tool that can be used to do good in the world and that can be used to impact the kingdom of God mightily. She will also realize that things might be hard now. Things have never been easy. Things have always been difficult, but with God's help, she will succeed. Now you see the difference between somebody who comes in with the poor me, it can't work mm -hmm. out mindset versus the person mm -hmm. who comes in and says, you know what? It's tough, but it's not tougher than me. That's I right. Will, I will conquer. I will get through it, right? That, it might look small to you, but it has a big part to play in your finances. So that's number two. And if you think I don't have a scripture for that, Set Mark 9, verse 23. Everything is possible for the one who believes. And I believe this is a scripture where Jesus said, what do you mean if I can? What do you mean if I can do it? Everything, including your financial circumstances, is possible for the person who believes. But if you don't have any belief, then it's not going to happen to you. You decide whether or not you're going to play the victim, you're going to play the poor me story, or you're going to rise above your challenges. And I know it might sound oversimplified, but if you break it down, that's all it boils down to. Whether or not you choose to rise above your situation, or you're going to just let life happen to you and never change it. Now, number three is where we're going to start to get practical now. Yes. We need to identify what's happening with our money. Where back, is please. my money going? The average person cannot tell me what they spent their money on two weeks ago. We think it lasts that search. And say, no, or a I'm... month ago or six weeks ago. Every single one of the ladies I work with, they can tell me. What did they do with their money yesterday, a week ago? two weeks ago. You see, many times we say, oh, them teeth me. Mm -hmm. Or the money just disappear. Yeah. Listen, the thief is staring you right back in the mirror. Stand in the <laughs> mirror and there is a thief. There is a person who stole the money. Somebody right? say inflation. Inflation will always be there. I'm not going to discount that. But the reality is, what are we going to do to get ahead of inflation? How are we going to get around it, right? 
It starts with you identifying truly how much the food costs, right? You probably have an idea, but trust me, what you have as an idea is probably very different from the reality of what you really spend on certain things. And if we look at Proverbs 21, verse 20, it says the wise man saves for the future, but what does the foolish man do? Spends Everything that it. he gets, he spends it, right? So the question is, are you spending more than you are bringing in? And how do you know what you're spending your money on? Is it lunch? Is it bus fare? Is it debt? Is it house? Is it medical expenses? Is it groceries? Is it snacks? Shopping? Where is your money going? That's, not, that's the very foundational piece of us getting ahead financially. Because if you don't know where your money is going, you won't know how to fix certain things. So I always recommend that you have to track your expenses. Track your spending. You can use a, go to the pharmacy or the wholesale or the bookstore and you can buy a little notebook and every time you spend money, you write it down. Or if you're fancy, you can use a spreadsheet. And if you're really, really fancy, you can go and you just go on your app store or your play store and you can download any expense tracker that you find and you start logging your expenses. And believe you me, this is going to open up to you exactly where your money is going. It's going to show you how much you spend on food, how much you spend on gas, how much you give away, because that is one thing that many of us do in excess. We give it away. Miss Mary come and say she needs money. Uncle Tom come and say he needs a little borrows. And we just give and give and give. And you don't know how much you're giving away, but when you start to write things down, it is very clear to you. And I can't tell you how many persons come to me and say, oh my God, I didn't realize I was spending X amount on that expense. No, you can't change what you don't face. And that is the point of this exercise. Wow. When you realize where you're spending your money, now you're armed with information to make changes. You might say, why am I spending money on X, Y, Z and I don't use it or I don't need it? Or I could shop over there instead of around the corner so that I can save some money, right? Those are the things that start to come up to you once you start to keep track of your expenses. Numbers don't lie, data don't lie. And this is the very thing that I started to do when I was in debt. This little exercise showed me what was going on with my money and what it forced me to do was to cut my expenses. I even moved apartments so that I could save money and use that money to pay down my debt. So it wasn't a second job I got or a raise up here or anything like that. It was just me being aware of what was going on with my money and I used the money that I was now saving that I was previously spending to pay off my debt. Am I making sense? Oh, definitely, yes. definitely, definitely. She needs help to say no. Listen, we have to learn to put on our oxygen mask first. It's very mm -hmm. hard, especially as women in the churches. We talk so about that a lot here. We, we love to help. We love to help everybody and don't realize that by helping everybody, we are dying of oxygen. And the sad reality is when we help everybody and we're in need, there is nobody to help us. I'm not saying don't give. I'm saying let your giving be Holy Spirit led. It cannot be completely based off your emotions. If you continue to do that, you will never, ever, ever get ahead. You cannot be making $10,000 and you give away nine. And then you end up have to borrow money to pay your bills. Is that wisdom? Absolutely not. Right? So tracking your spending will start to show you what am I doing with my money? Then we get to number four. 
when you know what's going on with your money, where you're spending your money, you can create a budget. And a budget is not something for you to be afraid of. It's simply you deciding and determining how you're going to spend your money before you spend it. So you don't pay the bills and then you plan out what's left. You plan out everything before you start spending. If you're on a fixed salary every month, you get the same salary, you can do this before you get paid. And you map it out and say, how much, excuse me, how much am I going to pay for light bill? Or how much do I estimate I'm going to pay for the light bill? How much for the cable? How much for groceries? How much am I going to save? How much am I going to invest? Right? You plan it out. And it has to be realistic. You cannot say, oh, I'm only going to spend $1,000 at the supermarket this month. And you very well know that your grocery bill is probably close to $10,000. No, you have to plan it based on what is your reality. And this is where the tracking comes in handy because now you have the raw data to say, you know what? I thought I was spending $10,000 for supermarket, but really and truly it's close to 15 because the prices keep going up. That is what you put on your budget. So you plan it out, right? And of course, budgeting is in the scripture. St. Luke 14, verse 28. I won't read the whole of it, but Jesus said, we must not begin until we count the cost. Nobody starts building a house without first checking up to see if they have enough money to finish building the house. Jesus mm. said it. St. Luke 14, verse 28. It's the same thing with your budget. You can't plan to go on big vacation and you don't set aside money to pay the rent or the mortgage and the light bill, right? Or pay courts. All of this has to be planned out to see whether or not you have the money to do all the things you want to do. What tends to happen is many of us spend first and then figure it out later. We have to flip the script. We have to figure it out first, figure out where the money is coming from to do all these things, and then we spend. Now, what tends to happen when we spend first and then figure it out later is when the money runs out, what do we do? Borrow. And Get a loan. Go. There you go. That is what causes many of us to go into debt because we don't plan out the money first, right? So when the money runs out, you say, you know what? Me just uh, go down there to uh, the loan shark and yeah. borrow a little uh, small, credit union. right? Or tap my, my savings in the credit union or draw the investment on my insurance. And all of that, all that is doing is you're setting yourself back because you're not able to get ahead right so count the cost and i have another scripture here for you proverbs 27 verse 23 says you have to know the state of your uh, flocks you have to know what's going on with your money and one way you do that is by doing your budget now let me backtrack a little i don't have it on the slide here if when you do your budget, you realize that you have more expenses than income, then you have two choices. I love to simplify things. I don't love to make money complicated. You have two choices. You either reduce your expenses or increase your income, right? It's not rocket science. So if you do your budget and you realize, hey, I have more going out than what is coming in, then I have to look at what I have going out and see what can I cut. Can I reduce the grocery? Can I move so I can pay a cheaper rent? Whatever it is, you know where you're spending money, right? You have to determine what you can reduce or cut out. And if there is nothing to cut, or if you don't want to cut anything, the flip side is you have to find a way to bring in more money. And how do you do that? You do a little side hustle. Or if you work a nine to five, you try and go for that bigger promotion or you get a better paying job. This is where the mindset comes into play. Honestly, you see how it all ties together now? Because I know when some of you hear that, you're like, that is too much stress and I can't, I can't take on no more stress on my life. 
But this is how the wealthy think. They figure it out and they say, all right, if I don't have enough money to cover my bills, how am I going to bring in more money? And they figure it out and they go after it and they start bringing in more money, right? That is the only way you can get ahead. But as I said, you won't know whether or not you are in the red or in the black if you don't do your budget. No, we're coming down. Who is still with me? Right here with my book on my paper. <laughs> Number five, then an emergency fund. An emergency fund. This is one of the key reasons why many of us have to run to the financial institution to borrow money to get us through or a little crisis is because we don't have a cushion for rainy day, right? An emergency fund is you putting on your oxygen mask first and being able to deal with a medical emergency or something breaking in your house that you need to fix or you suddenly losing your job. Look at what happened in COVID. Right? Many persons were caught unprepared for COVID. They lost a job or their hours were reduced and they had nothing to fall back on. This is where an emergency fund comes in handy. When you have your emergency fund, death is another one. Thank you. When an, emer when, when an emergency happens, you will have the little savings that you can draw down on so you don't have to stress and you don't have to run to Miss Mary or Mass Tom to borrow money or the credit union or the loan shark because you have money stashed away to deal with these things, right? Now, this is one of my favorite scripture references as it relates to emergencies. Remember when Joseph was in Egypt and when he had the dream about the seven fat, cow, the seven fat cows and the seven meager cows, right? What did he tell Pharaoh? The interpretation of the dream was that there would be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. What did Joseph do in the seven years of plenty? He gathered. Somebody, he gathered, right? He stored away. And why did he do that? For any day. Because he knew that seven years of lean time was coming up. No. If you read Genesis 41, it's hidden there. You will see exactly what percentage of the grain Joseph stored up for the seven years of famine. It was 20%. The Bible says one fifth. He would set that aside. And when the seven years of lean came or famine came, what was Joseph able to do? He was able to sell grain, not only to the Egyptians, but people from neighboring countries came and they bought grain. Listen to him. He didn't give it away. That is a biblical principle right there. He did not give it away. He sold it. All right. He sold it so that Egypt would always have money. This is an emergency fund. When things are cushy, when we have money coming in, we should not spend it all. We have to set aside something so that when death happens or we need to go to the doctor and insurance won't cover it or the car suddenly needs a battery or it needs two tires or something breaks in the house, we have money to pay for these things. Everybody still with me? Oh, yes. And you might be saying, I don't know how much money to save. Again, this is where your budget comes in place. You're going to look at how much you need to survive, how much you need to pay for your rent or your mortgage and your light bill and your water bill and all the things that you need to survive. Not once, you know, not to do your hair or to go shopping or to go on vacation. If you should lose your job tomorrow, what would you need to live for one month? You're going to take that amount and you're going to multiply it by three, four, five, or six. And that's going to give you your emergency fund target. So let's say your needs come up to $50,000 Jamaican dollars for a month. 
your three month emergency fund would be $150,000. You wanna save towards that and set it aside in a separate bank account so that when things happen, you don't need to borrow money. Got it? Yes. Number six, pay off high interest rate debts. And remember we talked about how this is one of the things that stress out a lot of us, right? We don't realize that things like credit cards and payday loans and higher purchase, they come with very, very, very high interest rates. That is why no matter how much you pay the minimum balance, mm -hmm. it's as if the loan does not go down. That to us right? here. You buy, you take out the piece of furniture from Quartz or Singer and three years, you paid for it and you're like, no man, how this can done? Not to mention mm -hmm. the credit cards. I think credit cards in Jamaica, the interest rates are like 48 to 50%. You wow. think about that. You are paying for every dollar that you are paying, the bank is taking 50 cents and keeping it in their pocket. And they're only putting 50 cents on the amount that you borrow. Payday loans, loan sharks, same problem. I think they are like in the 20 and 30% interest rates. So use this as a rule of thumb. Any loan with an interest rate over 10%, high interest rate. And you want to get rid of those as soon as possible because we know this, Proverbs 22, verse 7, the borrower is servant to the lender. Once you owe money, you're on the hook until you pay it back. If you don't pay it back, it's going to come up on your credit report. And when you're ready for another loan, they're going to ding you and say, no, but you owe this bill and that loan from how much years ago. And it's affecting your credit rating and we can't lend you the money or we won't lend you as much money. Or if we lend it to you, we're going to charge you extremely high interest. You're essentially a slave, right? So how you get out of this is you pay them down and pay them off as soon as possible. Is it possible to do that? It definitely is. And then that money that you are currently putting on the debt, you can then save it. And not only save it, but you can start investing it so that your money can start to grow and so that you can, excuse me, start to build wealth. So we are currently at the very last one. We're gonna to get to your questions, Jazz. Tithing and giving. I will never ever leave this out because it is one of the foundational principles on which Christians set themselves apart from the world. But remember how I told you that the world is using biblical principles to get ahead while the church is not. This is what the world does a lot of. They do it for various reasons. You know, Some do it for tax breaks. Some do it for tax benefits. Some do it because they want to be seen. But the principles cannot lie. And the fact is when we give, we get back and we get back more. What I just want you to do is be conscious that it's not only about the giving and the tithing because we cannot rob God. We should not rob God. We have to honor that part of our kingdom obligation. What I want you to do is realize that there are so many other things that is included in how we manage our money. So our several steps. Set realistic goals, adjust your mindset. You have to know where your money is going. When you know that you have to create a budget, have an emergency fund stacked away, pay off your high interest rate debt. And when you do that, you start to invest that money. And finally, tithing and giving. Now, I actually have two free resources for you that I'm gonna put in the chat. And one is a wealth guide that I put together. I released it earlier this year to help her, and it covers all of what we talked about, to guide you as to exactly how you can go about 
building wealth, how you can start to go about attaining or obtaining financial freedom, right? I put, I'm putting the links in the chat. And then the link is late, coming up. Late last year, I decided to put together some financial declarations that we can make about our money and it's based on scriptural principles. So this is, that one is clickable. That is the wealth guide. And then the second one is the financial declarations that are based, solely based on scripture. They have scriptures to back up all of them. And if you wanna follow me on social media, it's Charlene Money Coach. I am there all the time talking about money and financial principles and how we can merge the two. And I have loads of content that I share because as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this topic. I want to help my fellow Christian sisters and brothers, if there are any here, to realize that, listen, you can do both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It doesn't have to be serve God only and just wait until glory comes when we die. But you can enjoy life here on earth while honoring God. I've seen so many women overcome the financial obstacles that they're dealing with to go on to make a lot of money. And because they're making a lot of money, they can give a lot of money, right? Because it's all about kingdom impact. That's what I'm passionate about, kingdom impact. We just need to ensure that we're doing it the right way. So with that, I'm going to take questions. I have <laughs> a question. <laughs> hey, Dana, that's you? Yes, that's me. Can you hear Go me? Go ahead. Yes. So I know that the, the, the high interest credit card and debt that you pay up, but remember you saying that if you have, um, when you say you have to reduce your expense or get an increase or whatever, but at the same time, you know that the interest, the more money, the, the, the interest rate is high. So the, the amount you pay down, like say your minimum payment is $10, but you pay a hundred, but then it's still, majority still goes to the, the thing than your, than the, the loan itself. So what, how does that work? What kind of loan are we talking about? Like, for example, just a, uh, okay, let me, let me see. Like a, like a car loan with a high interest. So what you do, you have to go to your financial institution and tell them to apply the extra money that you're paying towards a principal. Sometimes you have to tell them, give them clear directives, right? Yes, Sharon, I'm, I'm in Cayman. <laughs> yeah. You have to give the banks or the credit unions clear directive as to what to do with the extra money. Because if you don't, what they're going to do is pretty much use it as a prepayment then. So they're going to say, oh, she's probably paying next month and two months extra payment because she probably won't have any money coming in then. You have to tell them, no, I want you to put the $90. Let's say it's $100 and 10 is for is the regular payment. I want you to put the $90 on the actual loan balance. And by doing that, you will find that the principal starts to come down so that you can actually get out of debt faster. The other way that you can do it is to refinance your yes. loan. So I was you just can about go... to ask that. But when they refinance it, that's adding extra years. Like... Right, so like you have to be over. careful. Yes, you have to be careful when you're refinancing. You have to know how close you are to finishing the loan. If you're very close to finishing, paying off the loan, closing it off, it doesn't make sense to refinance because the closer you get to ending the loan, the more of your money is going towards the principal or the money that you borrowed, right? So if you're like a year or two out, it doesn't make sense to refinance because when you do, you're going to start all over again. But let's say you are at the very beginning 
of the loan cycle or towards the middle. If you can get a lower interest rate loan, then yes, you can go get that. And then what that will do is free up more money for you so that you can start to get out of debt faster. So let's say you were paying $500 at bank A and you switched and now you can pay 350. You can continue paying the 500, you know, but now that extra 150 can now go towards paying down the loan faster. Making sense? Okay, makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. So always be careful before you run into the refinancing thing. Just know where you are in your loan cycle. So sometimes okay, when you no refinance, you have you. to go back over the whole loan loan processing fee and all of that. That yes. um, yeah. Yes. Sometimes like, yeah, it's and not then it's starting from scratch and it add more years, like the extra yes. five more years on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you okay. just have to be careful just, with, with, with the refinancing. But it is what I used to to get out of my debt faster. I refinanced my because credit cards was one of my big ones. And I used refinancing to, to get out of my credit card debt faster. I swapped, I think I swapped like a 16% credit card for a loan that was probably 8%. So you see how big of a difference that was? Yeah. I kind of had the same situation with um my car when I just got my car in the US. Um, I think the rate was like about close to 17%. And about three months after I used that to build my credit a little bit, I refinanced and brought it down to 3.99. So that was like, you know, taking off like a whole 14% or so off. Exactly. It. Yeah. Marsha is asking if I'm mortgage free. Unfortunately, not. <laughs> that was good. Like, you did clarify that. That's how I said. I did clarify that. Yes, consumer debt is different from mortgage debt. So I'm consumer debt free, but no, not mortgage yet. So I, I have a question on um, the consumer debt. So would you suggest, in your wisdom and experience and all of this, if somebody is buying a car and can buy the car cash? to go ahead and do that? If you have an emergency fund fully funded, yeah. Okay. If, if, you have, if you have something to fall back on, if that car breaks down, then yes. Right? Then money has to hold Kesha is asking what's the difference. Right. So, so I don't, it's not, it's not that I'm saying don't buy a car, you know, but you have to go into these things Why? your eyes wide open, right? So let's say you need a car, right? You're in a, you live in a certain area. It's very hard for you to get public transportation. You need a car to get around. You can buy, take out the loan and buy the car, but doesn't mean that you need to buy a brand new car of the car lot. You understand? It you don't want a lemon either to come and name out the money. Right? It doesn't mean that you have to buy the most expensive vehicle that's out there. You can buy a reliable comfortable vehicle with a loan payment that you can afford and not be in a situation where you're stressed out, right? It's just uh, being aware of these things. And then once you have the loan, you say, you know what? The bank give me seven years to pay it off. I'm going to get it done in five or four. Understand? Is credit union unsecured loans better to take than the loans from regular banks? Interest rate. Check out the interest rate. It depends on what the interest rates are. If the interest rate on the unsecured loan is higher, then it doesn't make sense because the higher the interest rate is the more the bank is going to take your money and pocket it, right? We can't afford to have that in these times. So always look at the interest rate. Other things that you can look at would also be the processing fees, right? What percentage mm -hmm. of the loan is the bank charging as a processing fee? If it's gonna be way more at the regular bank than the unsecured loan, and you factor that into the interest rate as well, then it might make sense to just go the unsecured loan route and know that, listen, if they give me five years to pay it off, I'm gonna go hard and pay it off in two. Yep. Um, um, if you have a loan with the bank, would you suggest switching to the credit union again? It depends on how far you are in your loan and the interest rate 
that the bank is giving you versus the credit union, right? You just have to be, ask for details. Many of us, were just run in and we only look at the minimum payment that we have to make, right? Here's a simple math that you can do. If they tell you the minimum payment is X amount and we're going to lend the money to you for 10 years, I want you to take that minimum payment, multiply it by the 10 years. I remember each year has 12 months and that's yeah. going to show you exactly how much how you're going to pay over the life of the loan. Do it yeah, three times the amount. Right, do it that way so you can do the comparison that way. So, if one bank is gonna say if you borrow money from one bank and it's gonna cost you a million dollars over the life of the loan, and another one is gonna cost you a million five, then you realize which one you should choose, right? So, do it that way. Do that, Andrea has her hand up. Go ahead, Andrea. Hi, um, I just came on not long ago. I'm not sure if you're just talking about loans or mortgages. Could you, ex could you explain to me um, how you, like, explain to me um, the, the trust when you, for example, when you take all your assets, your mortgages and you know, every, all your investments and stuff like that and put it in trust. Mm -hmm. And then you leave a beneficiary for it. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess, for example, if you're selling, if you have a house and you're selling after 15 years or whatever, you know, you instead of leaving it to your child, um, where if you do sell or if they sell, it, it, you know, the government will take capital gains from it. Mm -hmm. So if we put all the mortgage and you, the stuff in trust, the government doesn't take it because it's going to keep going to your beneficiary. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm understanding. I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if I really get it. But this is what I'm understanding. And that's how you keep generational wealth because it just keeps changing beneficiaries. Because they don't sell it. You're not, yeah, you're not really, even if you sell it, it's the trust that's selling it. It's still going back in the trust. Okay. I'm Am not I, an estate planner, so I can't weigh in on that. Um, it's, it's not really... Um, it's it's a way of 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 keeping your wealth in the family. Yeah, that's what a lot of wealthy people do. Yeah, but I think, that am I am I understanding it correctly? Like I kind of feel as if I'm not. Is is what I'm saying correct? I am not a hundred percent certain as it relates to the estate tax and the capital gains tax. Um, I know that estate tax is paid when pretty much assets are passed from pretty much the deceased to the beneficiary, right? I don't know whether or not having the assets in a trust protects you from that. The best person to ask would be an estate planner or a lawyer who specializes in, in estate planning. Okay. Yeah, if I don't know the answer to something, I'm, I'm not gonna fudge it. <laughs> so, okay, no, that, that's okay, thanks. Um, yeah. I have a question. Hmm? All right, Janice, hold um, on, Janice. There's a question here from Jazz in the chat, and then we take your question, Janice. She says concession okay. from the government is closing and you need a and you need a vehicle. Is there anything wrong with getting a new vehicle? If come again, concession. Concession, yeah. You know, sometimes when certain government workers use a concession and got mm -hmm. a Honda or Toyota, get a brand new spanking vehicle. So she's saying, is there anything wrong with getting a new vehicle with that? You know, I concept? am all about running numbers. All right. We know that when you get a brand new vehicle and if you're going to get a, I think it's 20% concession, if I remember correctly, from when I was living there, you will essentially get up to three years or at least a year free warranty and you get certain service, you get a certain period where you don't have to pay for your servicing or for maintaining the vehicle, right? I want you to factor all of that in into your decision. It's hard for me to tell you, no, it's better to go buy a 
2019 Honda versus a 2023 brand new Toyota. I just want you to run numbers. Do the math. And I guess it would, it, would, right? it would also um, have to do with what else is going on with your finances. Yes, because you have to be able to afford the loan payments comfortably. So yes, while you might be able to get the 20% duty-free and get a brand new vehicle that you don't have to service, if the loan payment is going to force you to be in a situation where if an emergency pops up, you have no breathing room, you cannot save, you cannot invest, then that might not be the best use of your money, right? Also, if you're going to be trapped in a loan situation where you're paying a loan for seven years or 10 years, it might also not be the best use of your money. So I'm not saying don't buy a new car. I'm just saying be very conscious before you make these decisions. And then once you are in the situation, try as best as possible to get out of it as quickly as possible. You don't have to stick to the payment terms that the bank gives you. You can get out of it faster. Even your mortgage, you can get out of it faster than the 20 or 25 years that the bank gives you. Um, Kesha said, I drive a 2000 vehicle, premium brand, 23 year old of premium branding. Um, um, go ahead, Janice. And then I have another question for you, um, Charlene. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question is, um, you know, we Jamaican love to show a partner. So what do you think about that? Partner is a great savings tool. If you don't have the discipline to do it yourself every month and you find that you're better able to save by throwing your partner, throw your partner. What I want you to do, though, is before you get the partner, I want you to have a plan for it. I don't want you to get the partner and say, yeah, Miami trick time. Or yeah, I have a uh, plan to, 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 to invest it or to roll right? it over there so must, that I plan to name it. Right. There must be some use, that, some good use that you're going to put the partner savings towards. Even if you're going to spend some, right, because they're saving towards a goal, I want you to save something out of it. Or else you'll pretty much be just delaying the spending for the entire length of the partner until you get the partner draw. Mm, I me? like that. I like that. Yeah, you have to put you have to put down something. You have to think about it this way. How about using it to pay off debt though? Yes, you can, but remember we need to have the emergency fund as well. Right? We can't because if you use all your savings to pay off your debt, think with me. If you use all your savings to pay off your debt. And an emergency pops up, where are you going to get money from to pay for the emergency? You're going to have to go back in debt, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a balancing act. And I know it sounds probably like it's a lot. It's not a lot, right? It's not confusing. Just think about, all right, how am I practically going to achieve both? So it may be that you'll split the money in half, 50% to save and 50% towards paying off debt. Or... Yeah, yeah. If your job is very secure, you can say, all right, I can probably save 30 and put 70% on the debt. There is no right or wrong way to managing your money. It all depends on your comfort level and your financial situation. But don't just run ahead blindly and do things. The biggest thing I want to take away from tonight's session is think. Think and plan before you act. And it takes time. It takes time, right? Absolutely, yes. It it's takes like time. So riding a bicycle, you don't get up and as a think back to your childhood, you don't just see the bicycle and jump on it and master it right away. Many times you you fell off, probably get a bruised knee and an elbow, and then one day you master it. These things take time to master. Many of us are just scared to try because we think we can't do it or it's complicated. No, it's not. It just takes you being disciplined, focused, and trusting the process and trusting it long enough for it to actually pay off for you. Work, yeah. I see um, Jazz put here, can I keep it in my pocket going forward? And she said, I had a dream last night about a church partner and I'm going forward in it. <laughs> All right, Miss Josephine. <laughs> I guess this is your confirmation tonight. But I wanted to ask you, Charlene, um, many of us, the idea of having a money coach 
or you know we hear a lot of times like Sajikor, you will hear about a financial advisor or Scotia will have a financial advisor but those are really on the level of their products mm -hmm. but what are some of the benefits because I love your thrust I love what you do in terms of helping women Christian women because you're coming you're coming to us with scripture and bible so I mean you know we have to be of that mindset mm -hmm. what are the benefits um having been in this business and, you know, like just here saying, can I keep it in my pocket going forward? Because I, I think that a lot of women, um, because I remember, you know, certain things that you have spoken about, you're paying on the loan for a year and it's $3,000 difference. And you're like, what? You know, and, and, and having experiences like those pulled me, you know, to a place of saying, pay notice because listen, when you're broke, you know, and when you're in a situation, you know, and you go down, and those of us who are teachers, and you go down at JTA, you go down at TIP. <laughs> and they tell you, oh, you can get three, three times your savings. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you're gone, right? You're not asked no question mm -hmm. until you're in another jam again. And you come back and you realize, eh, eh, you're not even put a dent in what you took the last time. So it was, it was um, experiences like this that pushed me to really, really be careful about, you know, and really, really be calculated about things that I do and it, and, and it took you know time and experience and so on to say all right is it a need or a want what can I do what can I you know so what I what 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 I did expound for us that does such a lovely presentation why we need to have somebody like you as just say in our corner the fact is many of us were not taught how to manage money no fault of our parents, no fault of our churches, as I mentioned before. The reality is we, they, they can't teach us what they don't know. So myself as a money coach, I essentially hold your hand through the entire process so that you can walk away and manage your money on your own, right? I help you to establish a strategy and a system that works for your finances. I help you to set up certain money habits and routines that can help you to achieve your financial goals. And I open your eyes to exactly what is possible. I can't tell you how many of my clients come to me with overwhelming amounts of debt and they decided to trust me and trust the process. They decided that they were going to invest their time and their money. And now they're making boatloads of money all because I opened their eyes to what was possible. Many of us, we don't have anybody in our corner to cheer us on and to yes. show us what is possible, right? And to show us another way around. And because we were not taught, we get confused at all the possibilities that are out there. Heard you in the introduction, Pastor Nicola, saying how you went on TikTok and you saw how many different videos there were about financial freedom and financial literacy. Listen, there are myriads out there, but what I help my clients with is to find what works for them, right? Right now I do individual coaching so that I work with you one-on-one -on -one to say, all right, this is a strategy that you need to get to this goal by this time. You hear and Charles and others, all of us? Yes. Because I it mean, sometimes- possible. When it's possible. Said, so that's it. Okay, Donna. Charlene, I have a question. Us like so, you know, you know how they trick us and tell us, oh, so you um instead, you know, normally for a car is five years, and they said, oh, but we can stretch it out for seven years. So then you have a lesser payment. It's a trick, right? It is a trick. <laughs> First of all, longer that, right? As I said, whenever you hear, anytime you hear loan. I want you to just take out your calculator. Yeah, everybody has, has a calculator on their phone, right? And I want you to say, all right, what is the minimum payment? And they tell you. And, you, and they tell you how long you have to pay for it. I want you to work it out, right? And you're going to see how much. So like you borrow a million dollars. When you do the calculation, you might realize that by the time you finish, you're paying seven million. How does that make sense? Maybe you're in a situation where you need to borrow the $1 million, but you don't have to take the seven or the 10 years to pay it off. Don't let them fool you. And even if you take the seven year term, make it up in your mind. Say, you know what? We're going to get out of this earlier. 
I don't know how, but we're going to figure it out. That mindset, that no, the bullet point number two, which should really be number one, that mindset, you can't go wrong with it. That's where many of us- I think the tithing us... should be number one. Though. As a pastor, I think the tithing should be number one. But <laughs> Yeah, I know. I get yeah. you. I know. All right, and fashion. <laughs> Afasha kind of open a can of worms right here. And Afasha is a financial in that field too, right? Um, and she says here, what does it cost to trust you? I think people are thinking of it as an additional expense, paying someone to tell them, paying money coach to tell them how to spend their money. And she said, I'm all for it, by the way. And I thought about that, but I would just want to say, I think that it is an investment that's worth it, you know? I think it's kind of like you have a leak and you need a new pipe cock. Are you going to spend the money to buy the pipe cock? Are you going to continue to make the water leak? Exactly. So if you're sitting there, say that again. That's exactly it. What's the cost of you remaining in the same situation as you are now? A What's the cost, time? Charlene? Huh? What is your cost per session? So I do a money audit session for 125 US. You can start there if you want. My one-on-one -on -one coaching, which lasts between three to four months, it's it has more, uh, it's a bigger investment. Um, it's 1275 US. But we can start with the money audit session, or I do have a mini course that helps people to set their financial goals, and that is $29. So okay. The, the mini course is twenty nine dollars. Yes, I have things at different price levels. Is now, it free? Space? It is. It's it's sixty minutes, and it comes with a workbook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds so I have, good. Have different things, different. I have from free to those things that that cost more money if you want to. Yes, yeah. From oh. free, like tonight, we thank you any, over here at Wid. Any pro pro bono for so people can't. So. I do a pro bono. I do it Holy Spirit led. I do have clients who I work with pro bono. I'm not gonna lie because this is more ministry for me than than money. But how do we um, get that one? <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, use the, you thing. use the promotion code win. <laughs> <laughs> but let me let me tell you that the, the, what I want to emphasize is that I have seen persons get on calls with me interested in wanting to work with me and they say you know what i can do it myself i can figure it out on my own and one year later 15 months later 18 months later they're back in my inbox charlene i didn't make any progress or i could have i spent the money that i should have spent with you on other things and i didn't realize it and they come work with me, and three months later, they're off like a rocket. Not even three months. I'm going to say one month later, they're off like a rocket. Because there is something about someone looking at your numbers and showing you exactly where you're going wrong, where you can make more money, guiding you so that you can use the extra money properly. There is something very transformational about it. But I, um, I love what I do, but you never find me. And it's probably a bad thing, but you never find me trying to convince people to invest. Yes, you have to people. want it. You have to. And all my clients come to me ready and rearing to go. So you'll never find me begging and beseeching. I say, no money needs to. In mm -mm. Yes, mm -mm. I like that. I like that. You have to, you have like to want it. Yeah, yeah. See, they want it. You have to know you want it or know that you don't. And whatever or it you is, know you don't, need. right? Yeah. But I do have, and I'm cognizant of the fact that there are some who probably just don't have that money to spend, which is why I have my free content. So that is I why they're the, in the problem to begin with. So I give you the free guide, use it. I give you the declarations, use it. You're on the session tonight, use it. Join my email list, find me on Instagram. I have so much content over there. It's not funny. You use it, right? You can teach yourself. I'm not going to lie. You can teach yourself and you can I do think so, this yeah. on yeah. your own. It is possible. Um, I want to read a comment here that Sonia says. Sonia says, one financial advisor once asked me, why don't I put my tithes money towards a debt each month? I told her that's not my money and it's not negotiable. And she said, I got a new advisor. Kiss me. 100% agree. 
100 percent agree I, um, I i will never discount tithing because it's not about the money it's about the fact that it's not our money remember yeah, we are called we to be good that one night on here stewards and a big part of doing that is giving god back his portion yes and 10 percent is the minimum right and if we're gonna be real kingdom citizens and have impact we have to honor god and that's the only way that our churches can actually have money so that they can stop keeping fish fry and barbecue and all these things i think our pastors are really really stressed because there is not enough tides coming in that's right? true but the reason we don't have enough tides going in is because step one two three four five six Yes. We have a plan for a month. No we budget, no plan, no, budget. no mindset. No mindset. We think so we spend all the tides and say, God will understand. There you go. Right? So um, you see, it all fits together. It does. Kesha has a question and I feel like I'm that friend. What are your thoughts on using savings as a part to clear credit cards? Because I'm sure. kind of right in this dilemma now. Just use my savings and whoops me at the credit card or what or back to the fund. Fund. do you have money set aside for an emergency kesha or nicola do you have based on remember we, i gave you the formula to calculate it right yes but let, listen to me charlene this is my take on my savings my savings kind of don't exist mm -hmm. in terms of once it reach into the savings account it must take hell and high water for us to come back out. I don't know if that is to my detriment or what. Yeah, so I'm right now, look at it this Nicole. way. Look at it this way. If you know you have enough money to cover a month or two of emergencies, right? And you have way in excess of that, okay? Let's say you have money that can cover nine months of emergencies. You don't need so much because you're in a good job. Um, but you have nine months worth of emergency funds stashed away. And you are paying 40 odd percent on a credit card. No, it's not so much. Mm -mm. It's like or if you're in the US, it's probably 15 or 16, right? What percentage do you think the bank is paying you on your savings? Probably 1% or 2%. So you're earning 2% on one hand while paying out 15% on the other hand. That I doesn't make mathemat mathematical sense. I know okay. some of us, you see, you have the opposite problem. You have the money and don't wanna part with it, not realizing that it's working against you, right? So if you are in that situation, then yes, use the savings to clear up the credit card, knowing that you will not run up the credit card again. That's a whole other session, right? If you won't run up the credit card again, then now you can put that money that was previously being used to pay the credit card. You can save it now and better yet, invest it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just looking. We, you know, I usually okay, say that no, we have to go there. home. Um, Andrea has her hand up. Yes, Andrea has her hand up for a while. Go ahead, Andrea. Hi, it's me again. Um, what happens is there a contingency plan for when you followed, you you seek to your financial advisor, you followed, you you've paid off your credit cards. Basically, you've paid off your car loans and everything like that. You're saving, you have like 10 months or whatever more. And then something like a big 911 happens and illness happens, you lose your work. And for the longest time, this is what you're doing. So you've now exhausted your savings. What would you, what is the contingency plan that you would have, especially now that, you know, we've, we have so much pandemic and everything that was going on. What would you suggest to people for that kind of, unexpected emergency where you end up using up all the savings that you've had yeah so unfortunately andrea 
sometimes things happen that are way outside of our control and our comfort zone and it can set us back right and in a situation like that unfortunately it would mean start starting over. from scratch starting over right okay. but with the mind so there's no that, contingency plan like going out and getting like disability because certain things certain disability doesn't cover like would you suggest something like that to, to people if you because... have if you have that at your disposal then i would say use every means that you have available to you so that you can get any benefit that's that's possible, right? But most of us live in countries where that's exactly not possible, exactly right where you pretty much just have to, for want of a better word, start from scratch all over. Yeah. But if you have benefits that you can leverage that your government or your state provides, then tap it. You know, use what is available for you because that's what your tax dollars went towards right don't feel guilty for using it but if there is nothing left to tap or to exhaust then unfortunately you'd have to to start over okay. um there's but, a quest okay but then i go to the scripture that talks about how god will restore what the canker worm and the palmer worm has eaten i never leave god out of my finances well not anymore um so i have seen god restore and work miracles and open doors and grant favor that were unexpected. So don't leave out that part. While we're talking about the practical part, we have to include the faith part too. Um, Reverend Esther, I saw her ask it two times. So we want to get the, um, so credit cards, um, how do you refinance credit cards? And um, so it's a few things that I'm just gonna pack together because the time is, is definitely going. How do you refinance a credit card loan? And there was a question of, do we really need credit card? It was, I, I can proudly say, I thought that it was one thing I was going to die, go to my grave and don't have. But as Kesha says, if you're in the US, you kind of sort of need to have a credit card. So I got my first credit card like about last year. I think it was last year I got my first credit card. Now I have four. I'm like, mm, girl, put on brakes, <laughs> right? Because this thing that guy, so how do you refinance credit card debt and is it a must have and of course that depends on our jurisdiction so you refinance it by simply going to another bank right you have the credit card with bank a you go to bank b or bank c and you ask for a loan right it may be unsecured or it may be secured they might ask for some asset to back that loan and they ask them for a loan. They'll ask you, what's the purpose? You tell them it's to pay off your credit card. They'll ask you for a statement to prove that you indeed owe this amount. You get the loan from them. You walk to bank A, you pay it off. And now you just focus on paying bank C, bank B or bank C who you borrowed the money from. It's as straightforward as that. Because most times you'll find that the interest rate on the credit card is much higher than even an unsecured loan from another mm -hmm. bank. Okay. So I oh, hope and is a credit card necessary? Credit cards get a bad rap simply because we, many of us don't, don't know, know how to, how use, to use, use it properly. It. Yeah. Right? But credit cards are actually a great tool to use to build your credit history. Yes. If you use a credit card properly and you show that, yeah, I have this loan and I pay it off in full every single month, what that does is it boosts your credit score or your credit rating, depending on which country you are in. So when you go to, let's say, buy a house, they will run your credit report and they will see that, yeah, she has good credit history. She has proven that she has a credit card. She pays it off in full every single month. Therefore, I can trust her and lend her X amount of money. So it is not, it's not necessary, but it's a good tool to have to build wealth to because having good credit is a part of building wealth right that's yeah. what the wealth they use the leverage wealth they borrow people's money flip it and now uh, make more money on it that's what the wealth they do so it's a great tool as part of your wealth building journey but is it absolutely necessary no if you have an emotional spending problem i would advise that you run and run far from credit cards if you can't get in control of your spending then credit cards are not the way for you to go. Yeah, but if you're not disciplined. 
if you're not disciplined. But if you don't have a problem with that, then you can use it. Pay it off in full every month. That's the key. Have to pay it off in full every month so that you don't pay these exorbitant amount of interest. That was one of the things. That was one of the things that um, I... I, I when when I learned because the lady at the bank I was opening a whole brand new bank account and she and I was like mm, 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 that's evil thing no 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 and she <laughs> said do you know how to use it and then she said that she said all you have to do is to make sure you pay I'm like okay all right but and and I, I think I've been good enough at it but the well, last two months it kind of run you I mean like breaks breaks yeah. breaks yeah, because you have to catch up on yourself yes um, and then one of the things I want to do I want to get back to is I want to have the money in my account I kind of want to use it like a debit card I want to have the money in my account so that I'm not waiting for my pay when my pay come a pay off credit card and then me back to square one again I want to have the pay the credit card bill come and me pay it and then me, you know kind of yeah that's how I want to do it that's the perfect way to use it how I always encourage persons is whenever you use your card right Think of it as a debit card. So essentially, you should be able to identify where the money where is coming the, yes. from to pay for this thing before you swipe the card. Right? But so many of us going, black people, we do it the opposite. Right? Yeah, we have said, my mother just put this from a credit card, like, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> yeah. No. So if you're going shopping on Amazon and you're gonna, your cart have two hundred and three hundred dollars in it. You should have that two or three hundred dollars already sitting in your bank account, right? So that when it hits the credit card, it's just a simple transfer, right? You yeah, pay it yeah. off right away. That's the only way you can get ahead of the banks. Banks should, I can't tell when last and bank then you can get the rewards, the points, and then such. you can get the rewards of the travel miles, the hotel hotel points, whatever it is, right? cash back whatever it is but as i said if you have a discipline problem then we need to talk <laughs> yes <laughs> all right so i see um some of you came on late um welcome thank you for being here if you need the recording um please put your email in the chat some persons have been sending it to me um privately um sister colleague says my problem is at the supermarket i plan to stop at the door and ask someone to buy what i want it doesn't matter if I go for one item or two. Usually I come out with a big bag. And, you know, I was thinking about that. We don't want to stretch it out too much. But that I think one of the problems, too, um, is that we overbuy. We yeah. overbuy and we waste food in the house. It's like because... right now I'm looking at a freezer over there mm -hmm. and it's full. But me kind of feel like me not have no food in my house. A yeah, lot of us, it's stemming from, this is a whole other story, but a lot in nutshell, a lot of us is stemming from our childhood. Upbringing, um, yeah. Or, or upbringing. We grew up, many of us grew up not having food. Could it yes. Say? Or having the food that we want. So that's security. Right? Yeah, I think so So too, now yeah. that we have the money to buy it or the wherewithal to buy it, we just buy it, right? And we put it down because when you feel for it, you want to know that it is there, right? A lot of that has to do with our money story, our money history. Um, but one of the things I do is when I realize that I bust my grocery budget, I actually keep all my grocery receipts and I go over there with a fine tooth comb to say, no, man, what, what happened this month? Right. And usually it's something like that, like I just overbuy, right? Yeah. Many of us all in COVID, COVID freaked us out so much that they still, like we still haven't recovered from that. So we pack the, have solid full, paper. the fridge full and then we end up have to throw away stuff. It, it, that in itself is not being a good steward. And I myself have been guilty of it too. It's better to buy the thing little, little than buy the whole walk and then it's spoiled or but some people feel that they better to just buy it in bulk and done it, it depends if you're if you're single right then why are you buying so much in bulk right we just have to as i said think before we make certain purchases if you know it won't spoil fine but if you know certain things are gonna go bad then it's a waste of money 
right? and some of us will spend our time in the market and we want the nice firm tomato and we want the nice firm carrot and then you see the fridge and rotten money gone down the drain guilty yeah <laughs> guilty. then Asha, and then i'm gonna ask um minister allison to close in prayer <clears throat> um, I think Charlene had covered my question. Good night, everybody. Okay. Um, I was I, I was just about to ask is have buying enough food for your household, um, is that so much of a bad thing? Because I think most of my salary, a good percentage goes goes towards food because I have children. Mm. So I try to ensure that I have enough food in the house and then I try to bring lunch to work. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can be broke, but I have food. So, Certain is things that are just a bad needs. thing? It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If you need, if you have a family, they need to eat, right? <laughs> you can't have them starving. The food right? not waste. That food is not wasting. Food. It's not like you're buying the stuff and it's spoiling and throwing out. So, no, right? It, it, it. Personal finance is personal. That's another takeaway. Nothing that I say here is cookie cutter, right? There are general principles to guide you, but I can't give the same strategy to Nicola that I give to Danasha and to Andrea, right? Because there are going to be varying circumstances and situations among you all, right? So if you need to buy food to feed your family, and if you have a large family, then go ahead and buy bulk and buy what you need. But we're talking about those of us who sometimes buy stuff, and I include myself, buy stuff, and then we end up have to throw it away because it's spoiled. Right. Thank you. And 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 as women, we have to leave a little reserve to fix up ourselves. And we're not saying yeah. no buy a nice roof and a nice you know. but it it's 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 you know, I, I'm about um what should I say now? Tiffany, okay. It's it's about making wise decisions and wise choices and we oh, really are yeah. grateful tonight for spending for you spending your time you could have been with a client earning some money but you came over here to minister to us tonight lady charlene and we are eternally grateful and as afasha say everybody after tonight should have an emergency fund because the amount of time you say <laughs> Right? The amount of times you said it tonight, you know, that you know, have an emergency fund. And what is the emergency fund? Three months expense or the budget. You know, years ago I used to be very, very disciplined with my budget. But now I me feel like I kind of have it in my head and I need to get back to basics. And yep. we, we can win in our financial life. We can win in our financial lives. We can thrive, not just survive. I love how you started out um, um, with us, you know, envisioning ourselves living that, you know, wonderful, stress-free life. And, the, and I thank you for the seven principles that you shared with us. And those of you who came on late will miss that. If you put your email, I will share that with you. Um, I order to move from seven... And that said us again, Sister Danasha. In, no, order to, in order for you to move from seven to ten, you need to get back to basic. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> from seven to ten, but true. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I need to get back to basic, you know, because sometimes you feel like you're you're, you're kind of at a space now. You're kind of like slip up. But yeah, I need to get back to ten. And those of us who we started off, you know, what's your financial rating from a one to ten? I hope that after tonight that you would definitely move up in the ratings, Danasha. And, you know, be accountable to yourself, have an accountability partner, and um, check out this stuff from um, Lady Charlene, follow her on, on, on social media. And if you are able to and can, you know, contact her. Uh, she's Holy Spirit led, that's what I love about her. So she will definitely, definitely help you. Reach out and get some help and don't drown in the debts, don't drown in the financial problems. God wants you to win. And he brought us here tonight and he brought um, Lady Charlene into our space and into your home tonight. And I'm really, really grateful, eternally grateful. Um, Yeah, Dana, she's like, she'll hear from me. So there you have her card up on the screen. 
I hope you're seeing it. I think it looks clear enough on my phone. So you can just go ahead and take a screenshot of it and share it with somebody. You might have somebody who, you know, does living from hand to mouth and does going around in this vicious cycle. If they come and you need a money coach in your corner, right? So she's on Instagram and she is um, everywhere. Lady Jazz is begging the Holy Spirit to lead you when you are going to build our right. <laughs> so uh, Minister Allison, if you could just close us in prayer. Oh, before Minister Allison close, so I put a, um, a link in the chat. So if it's your first time and you want to, we meet every Thursday. It's the same link. We talk about different things. We're all about empowerment of women, you know, embracing who we are, moving from one point of our life to another. We are all about that. So I invite you to join us using the same link again um, next week and other weeks to come. And I want to announce that, oh, we went to the takeaways and questions already, that um, we'll be having our inaugural conference. I know we have been meeting on Zoom from last year and I have gotten prophecies upon prophecies and about having a, conference and in-person conference we'll also have it on zoom so stay tuned to this space and you will hear further information about that and it will be on november 18 so save the date it will be in runaway bay saint Anne, jamaica if you can be there if not zoom um, attendance is an option all right over to you uh minister allison good night everyone good night barely hearing you Yes, I, as I'm going to pray, I must say that Win is so blessed. We are so blessed to have these great presenters coming to us every week. Yes, it can definitely. Be blessing. I, I don't take it for granted. My God. It was such a wonderful presentation. Knowledge is power. And I'm so happy to know that she's in Cayman. <laughs> Invite her to the church. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Glory to the Son of God. Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you, We Jesus. thank you, Lord, thank for you, bringing God. us together each Thursday night upon this platform, mighty Jesus. God, that we can be so empowered because we realize that knowledge is power. And you're worried thank you, that my people suffer because of Lock of knowledge. Jesus. Lord, Thank sometimes you, Lord. we are so ignorant, my God, of the things that we can answer us to go forward. Oh, Jesus. God, I want to thank you for win, mighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Things have been presenting to us in every form. Jesus. My Jesus, God, we give you God. praise. We deem it as a blessing, thank as a you, privilege. God. Oh, God, thank we lift you, our Jesus. hearts of gratitude unto thank your you, mighty Lord. God. Ah, oh God, we thank you for our sister tonight who has made this great mm. presentation. Mighty thank God, you, availing herself. My God, to give us, oh God, this knowledge, oh God. Father God, without a charge, we thank you. That thank you, Jesus. Her Hallelujah. God. She's able thank to you, deposit Lord. into us, mighty God. Ah, oh, we Jesus. thank you, Lord. We thank you, and I pray, God, as she continue this mandate, as she continue, God, oh my God, to educate and to uplift and to guide thank you, Jesus. and to help, my God, thank you, will Lord, Hallelujah, to thank you, to Jesus. her as well. You will take her beyond and further, mighty God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Thank you, Jesus. I pray your continuous blessings upon her, my God. Thank you, God. Lord. I pray your divine protection. You will surround Jesus. her, my God, in the name God, of Jesus wonderful. Christ Thank of you. Nazareth. Oh, God, I lift her up before you, Thank my God. You, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know everything about her. My Thank God, you, you know Lord. her heart desire. You know the things Jesus. that she desired of you. Jesus. Even though she come and she made Jesus. this great presentation, God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you know Thank the desire you, of her heart. And you promise to work upon the Jesus. desire of her heart. May you work upon the desire of her heart tonight, Lord. mighty God. In thank the Jesus. name of Jesus. We thank you for her. Thank you for her family. Yes, May Lord. you bless thank them. You, May you Jesus. preserve them. May you circle them, God. May you yes, seal them up God. under your covenant. Let there be an Thank open you, heaven over them, mighty God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name Nazareth. of Jesus. May you preserve her daily, Jesus. preserve her family. Mighty Redeemer. And coming Jesus. out in the Thank name you, of Jesus. Jesus. 
And I declare and Mighty decree God. that no weapon that's up against them shall prosper. Yes, Jehovah. Mighty God, you will take them from glory to glory. In the name Mighty of God, Jesus. And their lives will continue to be a Yes, blessing. Lord. Thank you for Pastor Johnson tonight, God. Thank Lord, you, I cannot Jesus. stop over emphasize. I cannot over emphasize, my God. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank that you, she Lord. has been so obedient to the Jesus, vision that I glorify that you, you given to her mighty, mighty God. God. Oh, Jesus. God, I pray that you will straighten her. Jesus. You will empower her. You will bless her. God. You will uplift Jesus. her. God, we know it's not easy. Jesus. programs together mighty God Hallelujah. To Thank and you, to Lord. have work my God it's not easy Jesus. and to have a family my but she has been making the sacrifice Jesus. Lord Jesus. my God and my father Jesus. to set a table before Jesus. women oh mighty my God, God and my father that we can get oh Thank God behind our our Bars Thank you, Jesus. Our blockades, our hindrances, my Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. In Hallelujah. The name of Jesus, the things that Thank ladies you, have Jesus. been struggling with over the years. Mighty my God. God. Thank the you, hurt, Lord Jesus. The pain, the dissatisfaction, mighty Thank God. You, the abuse. Mm. Oh, God, you are raised her up into the Hallelujah. kingdom. Thank you, God. Such a time as this. May I ask your God that you will Thank continue you, to bless this platform, keep it going. My God and my in Father, the name of Jesus, will Father, we ask of you, mighty God. In the name of Jesus, it will Jesus. go from strength to strength. Oh God, we pray for Jesus. increase upon this platform, mighty God, in the yes, name of Lord. Jesus. Bless Jesus. every person, my God, who make it their duty to be on every week. God, Jesus. I know I look forward to coming on this platform because Jesus. I know what it has been doing to my life. My it has been en God. enhancing Hallelujah. so many of us, mighty God. And so I mm. pray, God, you will keep this platform Jesus. going. And what if the enemy would have tried, mighty God, to come against this platform? We rebuke him with the Jesus, blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Mighty God, in the name of Jesus. Seal us up. In the name God. of Jesus. Keep it ever one. We go home tonight. We know that we are going educated tonight, God. We are going with power. Oh. My God. God, in the name of Jesus, of the things that we have thought and the things Jesus, we have heard. Jesus, I give you Let praise, give mighty most God. Earnest heed, my God, and they will not slip away from us, mighty God. Father, let us put them in good use. Oh, God, because if we get the knowledge and we store Jesus. them, God, they will do not do anything for us. But help us to exercise, my Amen. God, and to move according to your divine will. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we tell you thanks. In Hallelujah. Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jesus. Thank you, Minister mm -hmm. Allen. Um, Allison, thank you. Thank you so very much. I always appreciate your prayers. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the guide link. Um, so what I will do, I will put it in the group, the links that she sent. I'll put it in the group for those because it would be a little search back for those who are in the group. I could send it to you, Kesha. And those who I'm emailing, I will also be sure to get the links. Because she has sent two links of two um, resources. And as Minister Allison prayed, let us use it. Let us use it. Because Lord knows we might come here and tonight and we might feel motivated and feel encouraged. And we go back tomorrow, go and scratch your head. Let us, let us get this. Okay, she sent it again. Let us get the seven steps and let us use them and put them into practicality. And, you know, it is something that she has used. 22,000 US dollar worth of it. And a boy. And a cook of a bite. And in a month and in a year and three months, she paid it off through principles, um, you know, discipline and principles and all of that. So let us, you know, let us let us be encouraged by that and everything else that she said tonight. God bless you, ladies. God keep you, and may he cause his face to shine upon you. And I look forward to seeing you next week. You'd like to be in the group? All right, I'll 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 reach out to you, um, Reverend Esther Higgins. God bless you. I love you all, and I look forward to sharing time and fellowship with you again next week. All right, so we will go with, I have another song. Um, still a winning song god bless you lady delian always um a blessing to have you um here with us so we you can listen to this song as we take our leave tonight god bless you all love you all
is a lovely song. Listen to a part of it even before you go. Thank you so much for availing yourself Your again, lady. Kill money. Thank you, thank you so much. You don't know how grateful I am that you came and shared with us tonight. Walking in financial victory. Yes. We are born to win. I was born to reign in Christ. I am not defeated. No matter what I see, I will always be. I'll always win. Our money will win. I will always win. Yeah, 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 yeah. We close the curtains there tonight on this another beautiful session. God bless you. Take care and remember that you are born to win. You are born to win. So let us do what we have to do that is in our power and we will definitely win. All right. So I am going to go ahead and close now. Take care. Have yourselves a wonderful rest of night.